This was the Dish of Europe Battle Staff Ride 2012. This was the preliminary class dealing with the Battle of Nordlingen prior to visiting the battlefield. This video is characteristic of the style of fighting during the Thirty Years' War. Historians have been arguing as to the reasons for the, for the war practically ever since the end of the war. Many theories have been offered. The traditional explanation has been to characterize it as a religious war. However, Catholic France subsidized Lutheran Sweden in their war against Catholic Spain. This really doesn't adequately explain the reasons for the war. Marxists have claimed that it was class warfare. Their historical theories don't make much more sense than their economic theories. This seems to be the consensus of modern historians. Basically, it's all of the above. It's sort of, we can't figure it out, so we'll just say it's everything. The war involved almost every country in Europe. The motivation for, the, for a country at a specific time differs from the motivation of another country at a different time, or even the same country at a different time. The best answer is to look at the results. So this is Europe in 1618. These are the countries that were actively active participants. For example, even though Transylvania was actually part of the Ottoman Empire, they actually invaded the uh, invaded Austria twice during the war. These are the ones that provided aid. There is even evidence that Orthodox Russia invaded Catholic Poland to keep them busy so that they would not attack the Swedes here in Prussia so that Gustavus Adolphus could, get, could then mark, launch his invasion into Germany. These were the countries that remained neutral. The Swiss, Prussia, partly, mostly because Sweden was occupying it, and the Ottomans, because they were busy, they had their own problems. We look at the results. By the end of the war, Central Europe was destroyed. The war destroyed the hegemony of the House of Habsburg, the House of Habsburg was now two empires, the Spanish Habsburg and the House of Austria. In 1700, the House of Bourbon sat on the Spanish throne. The, war, the peace treaty of the war also recognized the independence of Switzerland and the Netherlands. The Thirty Years' War is an extremely complex event. Historians have been arguing as to the reason for the war since the end of the war. The war lasted for more than a generation. Almost everyone who had had anything to do with starting it was dead by the time the war ended. We still don't have a good reason, good answer for the reason. In fact, there is only one person that was in power when the war started that was at the treaty of, still in power at the, by the Treaty of Westphalia. So this part was supposed to be have been done by someone else. What were the troop types used during the Thirty Years' War? First, the infantry. The infant, Thirty Years' War infantry was a combined arms team of pikemen and musketeers. This is from the Polish movie The Deluge. It has a good representation of early 17th century warfare. A pike is basically a six meter long spear. This picture is from an early 17th century training manual. As an individual weapon, it's, a very, cumber it's very cumbersome. Individually, it's almost useless. So when it's used en masse, then it becomes a battlefield dominating weapon. The Renaissance pike was probably originally a Flemish weapon used during the craft guild wars during the, against the French. Its simplicity makes it almost impossible to know who actually invented the pike. It was the Swiss who perfected the use of the pike in blocks of pikemen. The Swiss fought a series of wars against the Burgundians. The Swiss pike blocks destroyed the Burgundian army every time. The Swiss pike blocks were almost unstoppable. The only thing that was ever found that would stop a pike formation was another pike formation. The pike dominated European battlefields for the next two centuries. This was the face of European infantry combat during the period. 
In the 16th century, the musketeers were only skirmisher support for the pike blocks. Over the course of the 16th century, musket designs were constantly improved. The musket eventually became part of the battle formation. The musketeers at the end of the 16th century were armed with matchlock muskets. Matchlock was a heavy, muzzle-loaded weapon. It required a rest to hold it horizontally. The standard size was 12 balls of lead of the size of the bore of the barrel. The musketeer carried a bandolier of pre-measured powder pouches for the pound of lead. This bandolier was referred to as the Twelve Apostles. We see it here. The weapon was fired by a burning fuse, or match. We see that here. While hand cannons certainly changed the face of battle, the human spirit being ever restless recognized that this was not the, the end-all and be-all of firearms uh, for actual warfare. They realized that guns had to be made easier to use, and you had to be able to actually aim them and stand a chance of hitting something with them. Tucking a hand cannon under your arm and hoping the ball is going to hit somewhere in the area of your target it just wasn't good enough. Well, about the middle of the 16th century, they came up with very, very simple serpentines that were attached to the side of the early hand cannons into which you could cut a match cord. A match cord was like a piece of hemp or cotton that would be soaked in a mixture of potassium nitrate or vinegar to keep it burning and smoldering. And you could manipulate it, load the gun, carry the match cord in your hand, cock it in the gun, actually raise the gun and, and fire it and get a semblance of accuracy out of it. By the 17th century, they got even more sophisticated. They uh, had actual spring-loaded uh, mechanisms such as this one, and they had uh, really refined the loading techniques. They used, uh, by the 1620s, 1630s, these bandoliers, and each one of these little charges, there were 12 of them, they, they nicknamed them the 12 apostles, actually. Uh, each one of these would have a little uh, charge of powder in it. You'd uh, load it, you would uh, clip your match cord into the cock, but the match cord would be burning, and you'd have both ends of the match cord burning because, uh, A, in case one went out, you didn't want to be stuck with uh, a loaded gun and no way to set it off, or B, if perhaps you grabbed the wrong one, you wanted to make sure at least whatever you grabbed was going to be burning and firing. Loading a matchlock musket's really not all that difficult. Take and pour your powder down the barrel from one of the little cartridges on your 12 apostles. Drop the ball down the barrel. Ram it with a scouring stick. They didn't call it a ramrod. They called it a scouring stick. Return. <clears throat> Primed. Blew off the powder, put the match cord in the cock, blow off the cord, test it, uncover the pan, and give fire. You could really fire these things about two or three times a minute if you really, uh, if you really did uh, practice with them. And for the first time, the foot soldier achieved parity with a mounted troop. It really democratized the battlefield. Traditionally, musketeers used the countermarch system. They would fire, return to the rear, and reload as they returned to the front. They did not fire in volleys. This was individual fire. This is from the Polish movie 1612. These troop types would need to be combined into a combined arms team in order to win battles. In this type of warfare, whomever breaks formation first dies. This is from the Spanish movie, Alatrista.
The Tercio was approximately 1,500 to 1,800 men, unit 12 pikes deep. This was a pike square with a belt of musketeers deployed three ranks deep. While it had firepower, it was still primarily a shock weapon. It was difficult to maneuver and a lot of people not engaged. However, this type of formation could take a lot of punishment before it cracked. So, this is, shows it in use. Here are our pikemen, surrounded by a belt of musketeers. Now we blow this up on the next on the next slide. Here. And once again, closer, here are pikemen surrounded by a block of musketeers. Now, the imperial tercio was a Spanish tercio with blocks of musketeers on each corner, as we see here. This is in use. And... Now, well, this shows it here on the battlefield. This is the block that we will blow up onto the next slide. As such, unit strength is between 1,000 and 1,500 troops, 12 pike ranks deep. Musketeer blocks were added to the corners to provide additional firepower. Pike to musketeer ratio would be approximately 50-50. So this is how it looks on the field. Here's the pike blocks with our musketeer support here on the flanks. And once again, this is how it looks on the field. The Dutch regiment, the Netherlands were basically a merchant empire. They had money, but no men. They had to rely on mercenaries. Maurits had to come up with a formation that was more efficient of their limited manpower. The Dutch regiment was smaller, more maneuverable, and utilized the entire manpower. So, as we see it here in the field, the blue box, this is its use on the field. The blue box will be blown up on the next slide. This example is from the English Civil War, not the Thirty Years' War, the English Civil War was fought at the same time as the Thirty Years' War, which is why I'm using this battle as an illustration. Okay, here it is, closer look. The regiment was 500 men. There was a block of pikes flanked by blocks of musketeers. So here we have the pike square, and here the musketeer flanks. And this shows it again on the field. After Nordlingen, this formation became the standard infantry formation until the invention of the plug bayonet in about 1660. Over this period, the ratio of muskets to pikes increased until by the end of the Thirty Years' War, it was approximately one-third pike and two-thirds muskets. At the beginning, it had been approximately 50-50. The army would also be deployed in two lines. So, once again, this shows it on the field. Now, for the Swedish Brigade. This is how it would be deployed. This part is the Swedish Army. This is the part that we will be exploring now. This here, this in the blue square, is the part that we will be blowing up on the next slide. Again, so this is our three brigades. Gustavus Adolphus grouped three Dutch-style regiments together to form a Swedish brigade. The Swedish brigade was between 1,500 and 2,000 men. Units were drawn up six ranks deep. This formation allowed some units of musketeers to provide flanking fire while remaining under cover of pike units. Swedish musketeers fired in three-rank volleys. So here it is in the here it is online. Here are the pike blocks here, here, and here. And the musketeers that were here, 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 and here. These two, 
these can now fire to the flanks. And once again on the field, the Swedish brigades were deployed in a very characteristic triangular formation. As you see here. Okay. And this is the area that was blown up earlier, showing once again, here's our three brigades. Showing this very characteristic triangular pattern. So English, so infantry summary, we've covered pikemen, musketeers, plus the Spanish tercio, the imperial tercio, the Dutch regiment, and the Swedish brigade. Now the cavalry. Cuirassier cavalry was armored in three-quarter plate, armed with broadsword and two wheel lock pistols in holsters. Here's an example of a holster. And here is another one. These only came down to a pro this three-quarter plate only came down to the knees. The armor is only down to here. And from here down, that's a leather boot. Well, matchlocks revolutionized the battlefield. They had one major problem. You couldn't carry them loaded and ready to fire. You had to manipulate them with two hands, and it took a while to get them into action. So obviously what was needed was some sort of mechanism where all a guy had to do was pick up a gun, pull the trigger, and have it go off. And that mechanism was the wheel lock. It appeared about 1515. It was very, very ingenious, complicated, clever, but very, very fast, and it was working properly, an extremely reliable system. As its name implies, it employed a spinning wheel. The wheel was serrated. You loaded the gun through the muzzle like you did in a normal uh, firearm. You would prime the pan, pull the dog's head down. Now, the dog's head had a piece of iron pyrite in it, not flint, because if you put flint in there, as you'll find out later on when we talk about the flintlock, uh, the flint would grind down the wheel where the pyrite actually made sparks itself. Okay, first you just basically loaded a wheel lock through the muzzle like you did other guns of the period. Round ball. Ram the ball in place. Then you took a special spanner, turned it about a quarter of a turn, Primed, closed the pan cover, brought the dog's head down, and gave fire. Prior to this, it just wouldn't be practical to have a one hand held gun where you had to hook another match cord into it. Didn't make sense. But the wheel lock actually made the handgun possible. Uh, it also was very popular in sporting weapons and in some high end military arms. The big problem with it was it was complicated. You had to have about 18 or 19 particular moving parts all working at the same time for it to work properly. But the one thing the wheel lock did do, it made the handgun possible. It was very, very popular and was even used well into the flintlock era. Lots and lots of people preferred the wheel lock because it was faster. And when it was working, it was a real marvel. One problem with the wheel, with the wheel lock was you could not keep it, keep it cocked for very long or the spring would lose its springiness. Medium cavalry, armed with a buff leather jacket, possibly a breastplate, armed with broadsword and two wheel lock pistols in holsters and possibly wheel lock carbine. Here's, here's an example of the carbine. Light cavalry, Croatian, Hungarian, and Polish light cavalry served in the Imperialist Army. They did not make good line cavalry, but they were excellent reconnaissance troops. The imperialists always had a better idea of where their opponents were than their opponents had of where the imperialists were. The Croatians were organized in units of 150 to 300 men. The dragoons were musketeers equipped with riding boots and horses. They rode on horseback and fought on foot. They were deployed in 100-man units. The three musketeers were members of a dragoon regiment. Now we need to deploy the, the cavalry. Okay. 
the blue box is the area that will will be blown up to show for the Imperialist Cavalry. Okay, Imperialist Cavalry formed up in blocks of approximately 800 horse, 10 ranks deep. They relied on firepower delivered in a carcola. This was a countermarch system for cavalry. So here are the basic blocks. Here are the basic blocks of cavalry. The reason for the carcola was because the real force of a cavalry charge is moral, not physical. Sword and lance are inefficient killing machines. Fire will pr produce more casualties than cold steel. Gives an idea of what the cavalry attack would look like. This is also from the Spanish movie Ala Triste. always had a limited amount of cavalry. They had fought a series of wars against Poland. The Polish army was primarily a shock cavalry with bright of infantry. The Swedes needed a method to counter the Polish cavalry support superiority. These are Polish wing hussars, not Swedes. They were the heavy cavalry of the Polish army. This is what the Swedes had to had to come up with a way to to deal with. the Polish movie, The Deluge. Swedish cavalry. This is the area that would blow up for the next slide. Swedish cavalry formed up in four ring squadron blocks of 200 horse. Swedish cavalry were the shock force. Musketeer units six ranks deep were deployed between the squadrons. These musketeers fired in three rank salvos. This is their fire, their Swedish firepower support. So here is the cavalry blocks, and here shows our musketeer formations. So summary with, of cavalry, we've covered Croatia, cavalry, medium cavalry, light cavalry, dragoons, plus the formations for the imperialist cavalry, and the Swedish cavalry. Now for artillery. This is also from the Sp Spanish movie. Gustavus Adolphus and others had attempted to standardize artillery at 24, 12, and 6 pounders. However, whenever a battle was won, the victor took whatever artillery was left on the battlefield. Coalition armies used whatever artillery the various armies brought to the, to the battle. When a fortress was taken, the artillery in the fortress was added to the army inventory. It didn't take very long before the artillery was a hodgepodge of types. Standard battle formations was infantry center, as we see here on the Swedish side, or here on the imperialist side. 
the imperial style armies basically drew up in a single line, which is what you kind of see here on this side. Swedish and Dutch style armies drew up in two lines, as we see here, line one and line two. Heavy and medium artillery was deployed in front of the infantry, as we see here and here, and a bit and here. The Swedes deployed light artillery in front of cavalry, as we see here and here. So, this is what we've covered what we've covered so far in this presentation, what was the Thirty Years' War was about, history of the Thirty Years' War, what troop types were used during the Thirty Years' War, which is infantry, broken down in between pikemen and musketeers, the infantry formations of the Spanish Tercio, the Imperialist Tercio, the Danish Regiment, and the Swedish Brigade. So we covered cavalry to include Cuirassier Cavalry, Medium Cavalry, Light Cavalry, and Dragoons, and the cavalry formations of the Imperialists and the Swedes. Also covered artillery and battle formations. Notice the infantry on this, on this, in this photo, in this artwork, are de deployed in his Dutch regiments. So be with us next time for the. Same back time, same for the history of the Battle of Nordlingen. Thank you.